that. Well, welcome everybody. Uh, I know it's a Thursday night, but welcome to Mobile Monday. How many people here first time tonight? All right, cool. Okay, how many people found us on Vita? How many people found us on Eventbrite? Very cool. All right, so, um, so tonight you guys are here for the Speed Up Effect. Um, this is a developer lab, so it's a little different from our normal uh, panel discussion. So it's gonna be a technical session, and so we invite questions from the audience. Um, it's an interactive, so if you are, how many people here write code? Have developers, perfect. So um, ask these folks lots of questions. If you have it, um, this is the whole intent for this, for this meetup is really to make it interactive, ask questions like, hey, how'd you do that? Or how does this affect? I have an app that does blah. How are you gonna help me? Um, definitely welcome. So that's uh, that's part of the, the format of tonight's event. Um, I'm Mario Tapia. I've been putting uh, developers together since 1999 in the mobile space. Um, so almost 18 years, uh, at least one meetup a month for the last 18 years. So it's um, been quite a bit. Um, so um, I've expanded. Uh, we, uh, I inherited a New York City chapter a couple of years ago, and so we do quarterly events there. I don't know how I'm able to get down there uh, each quarter, but we do. And also, um, if you have friends in New York or, so, or Los Angeles, um, we also do the quarterly events there. I'll show you kind of what's coming up. Uh, so the agenda for tonight, go through the welcome. Uh, we have the whole Monday overview. We'll do the dev lab with Packet Zoom, and then we'll do more networking, probably some more food and drinks in the back. Um, overall, we're about 140 cities worldwide. So um, from Tokyo to Tel Aviv, we have um, events happening throughout the, throughout the month. Um, in Silicon Valley, LA, and New York City, we're about 30,000 folks. So roughly about, if you guys signed up on Eventbrite, I have a questionnaire, but what's your function? Um, about a third of you are developers, um, the other third are product and marketing, and then the other third are business development and sales, with a little bit of, any designers here tonight? UI, UX? Maybe one? Yeah, all right. <laughs> um, so what do we do? So we have monthly topic meetups, I don't know if you guys attended the AI one last week. Um, that's more of our typical format of panel discussion. Tonight is our dev lab, and then we also do round table dinners. Um, we are corporate sponsored. We are a nonprofit 501c6, which so is an industry association. Um, more info, always find us at mobilemonday.us. Uh, Meetup, you guys folks who found us there. YouTube, so this is all being recorded, and we have over six years worth of topics that we've discussed. Um, on Facebook, or, uh, if you'd like to, we're also live streaming. Um, we also get free tickets or large discounts for conferences happening around the valley. So it's always nice to follow us on Facebook to get uh, access to some of those uh, discounts. Um, if you're uh, tweeting tonight, hashtag Mobile Monday. Um, or you can do uh, at Packet Zoom for tonight. Um, and I think uh, here's our upcoming event. So um, at the end, the beginning of June, hackathon in New York. At that same hackathon, there's 10,000 cash and prizes. We'll be bringing that to Silicon Valley September 8th, 9th, and 10th. So there's uh, 10K in, in cash and prizes for the top three participants. Um, Los Angeles, we have a dev lab with Amazon White Services uh, at the end of June. In July, we come back here to the Valley, doing location-based advertising with your maps. And then um, at the end of July, we'll be in Chicago doing the same demo with Amazon Filters. So that's kind of what's upcoming on, on the calendar. Um, and, and last but not least, please give a round of applause to our supporters. How many people here for Packet Zoom? Raise your hand. Please give guys a round of applause, please. Yay! And also thanks for the folks at Google Launchpad for hosting us here tonight, uh, and making this available. And, and Brett, over there in the back, it's, if you have questions about uh, about about the space, I know he's probably has a, you're eating a taco right now. <laughs> but um, but uh, Brett with the Google Launchpad teacher in the back uh, can also ask, answer questions about this space, um, focus on startups and ecosystems. So thank you very much. And without further ado, I'll introduce uh, first. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Patrick. I am uh, the sales engineering department at Packet Zoom. For those of you that don't know. Uh, Packetzoom is the leading mobile networking solution for mobile uh, apps. We offer developers an end-to-end -end mobile networking solution that helps to mitigate the network issues uh, the mobile app, uh, mobile networks present. 
uh, and thereby making the user experience better. You might be asking, how can better mobile networking lead to better user experience? Let's first talk about uh, user expectations. Studies have shown that a majority of users expected app to load in four seconds or less. Almost half expected two seconds or less. Of these impatient uh, users, very few of them would actually blame the network or the carrier. They'd actually just blame the app or the developer. Uh, we know this not to be the case. Let's take a look at a few popular apps uh, being used on a wireless network. This uh, just so happens to be the wireless network at our office that uh, struggles to get into our back conference room. The irony is not lost on me, a mobile networking uh, company with that network. Um, as you can see here, uh, the user experience leaves much to be desired on wireless networks. Instead of consuming data, the users are, um, are waiting for the data to be sent to them. Instead of browsing Groupon or looking into hotels or reading the news, uh, the latest thing Donald Trump has said, uh, they're waiting for their content to load. I'm sure that most of these apps were developed uh, using the best practices for developing a mobile app. Um, I'm sure they were tested and worked fine in office on Wi-Fi with the router 15 feet away. But the reality is when you get into a, uh, a real mobile network, uh, they change. Each mobile network is different. Each network changes uh, in time uh, due to, to environmental factors, uh, both human and natural. Here's some, uh, some data about those mobile networks. There's uh, millions of devices that use the PacketZoom SDK. Each of those devices sends us data points. We have billions of data points about the networks that these apps are connected to. What you see here is uh, what we call disconnects. That's the percent of sessions suffering from disconnects averaged across all the countries. Uh, it might be obvious, but red's bad, orange, yellow, bad, and green's good. Um, you can see that uh, countries with good disconnect percentages don't necessarily equal good speed. Again, red bad, green good, yellow in between. Hold the mic up a little closer to your mouth. I'm sorry. Can Can everybody hear me now? Yeah. It's a little awkward. The fact is this isn't even half the story. There's packet loss, there's high latency, there's low bandwidth, there is spotty coverage of dead zones in wireless networks. If we can overcome these issues, we can give our users the same great experience that we tested in our offices. Um, to point out also, there's uh, around 220 countries in the world, 800 mobile networks. Uh, we shouldn't expect our developers to be able to uh, program for each of these networks. To explain more about these network issues and what can be done to overcome them, allow me to introduce Chet Nahuja, the CTO and founder of PackageZoom. Chen comes from a networking background and mobile app background. He started at Riverbed, where he tried to squeeze every bit of performance out of wired networks, and moved on to AdMob, where he did the same for wireless performance. Finally, he ended up at Google, where while riding the Caltrain to work every day and trying to use his iPhone, the frustration with, mo with mobile networks boiled over, and he decided to do something about it. Without further ado, Chen. Thank you. Okay, let's assume that we're going to um, While that thing is loading, let me do something else here. It's loading. Let me know when it loads. No? Was that, was that annoying? <laughs> that's, that's what we fix. So that, we call that the spinning wheel of death. Uh, and how to avoid it. We'll talk about both those parts. What causes the spinning wheel of death and how do we avoid it? Uh, normal way and also the package only. Now, studies have shown, oh, before I go forward, uh, we have a hashtag, say no to slow. And at package zoom, you know, send us messages uh, if you want the slides or, or want to just talk to us, uh, do communicate. Okay. Studies have shown that the leading cause of spinning wheel of death is the network. Okay, so I'm going to take you through this journey today. I'm going to start 
with describing how the network is causing some of these problems. Uh, some of you are developers, uh, there's some uh, mixed crowd, so I'm trying to go slow and start from the bottom. Okay? Please don't get impatient. If you already know a lot of this stuff, the fun stuff will be coming late. Okay? So we start the networking stack with internet protocol, the IP. Everybody knows what IP address is. So the internet protocol is about addressing things so that you know you can actually address a node in, in a different corner of the world. Also routing packets to that node. So if I, if I have a computer node sitting here, trying to send packets to another node in China, that node has an IP address and I have an IP address. And that's the only way we can really communicate over the internet. Okay, that's a, that's a uh, 10,000 foot view of what IP is. Uh, on top of the IP stack, you have a reliable uh, stream oriented in order, big words, reliable stream oriented in order delivery of packets uh, through transport control protocol, TCP. But that's not the only way you can send packets over an IP network. You can also use an unreliable protocol. UDP. I like to think of UDP as a proxy for IP available in the user space. So whatever I can do with a bare IP, more or less I can do with UDP packets. And that, that part becomes significant as I describe uh, later on how you solve uh, the spinning wheel of that. So now most of the applications that you use on a daily basis use TCP, you know, your browser, um, you know, different apps on your phone, um, but some apps also use UDP because sometimes you don't want the streaming in order delivery of packets. Sometimes you just want to deliver a packet as soon as you can or just don't do it at all. And in those cases, you use, you, you use UDP. And then you would write some, some algorithm on top of UDP so that you can manage that process. Uh, for example, VOIP, you know, uh, video conferencing, uh, other apps which gaming uses UDP. Um, so you, you have apps which are using both TCP and UDP. Uh, these are, this is the install base in this world. If you, you know, if you look at any random router in the world, and you look at the traffic going through it, almost all of it is TCP or UDP. Now, there are other protocols and those layers, but we're not going to talk about those. Uh, because they don't concern us right now. Okay, so, this is what I call the software protocol stack. This is, you know, your programs you write, whether it's in the kernel or in the user space. What is it running on, on top of? What is the actual physical link between machines? It's wires, right? And all the machines in the world are connected by wires, correct? Correct? Okay, I, I should make an announcement. Uh, I'm gonna test you guys like this. So say yes or no, there are points for participation. No, that's not great. There are points for participation, but not just points, so you get t-shirts. So there are t-shirts for participation, yes. <laughs> t-shirt for the good man here. <laughs> uh, okay, so, so no, that's not correct. It's, most of the world is actually using the internet without wires now, over wireless. In fact, see, I'm not lying about the t-shirts. <laughs> so, most of the world is using the internet over wireless. Um, the study came out last November in 2016 uh, about I think the wireless, the mobile traffic overtook uh, non-mobile traffic for the first time. Uh, like it was 51 to 48.5% or something like that. Yeah. So what you really should be looking at is wireless as the base of your operation, not wires. And then Things have changed now. Most of the traffic is going to wireless, but what about the protocol stack? Uh, it's not changed. Everything you're using today on your phone, while you're sitting through the highway at 100 miles an hour, or while you're sitting in a train going through tunnels, or while you're moving from Wi-Fi to LTE, um, you're using you know you have one bar signal, or you have you have very strong Wi-Fi. In all those situations. You're using a software stack that was written 40 years ago, well, the foundations were laid 40 years ago, uh, and it was designed for wires. Well, what's wrong for designing with wires? Uh, let's see a picture. This is uh, you know fancy schmancy 
same slide I copied here. So you have this, you know, the, the original network wires connecting end to end and TCP worked fine, worked great on that. The difference today is that the last mile, or typically the last mile, is wireless. And if the last mile is wireless, the last mile is, becomes the hardest mile. And the last mile is so different from you know, what the, this software stack was designed for. So how is it different? It has much higher latency. We talk about actual numbers when we come to that section. It has much higher packet loss. We also talk about those numbers. And these are things you might hear a lot. You know, packet loss, latency, uh, these are buzzwords in the networking community. If you, if you read even a blog post, even like a, a casual blog post, it will probably talk about these factors. But something else that nobody really talks about is because, uh, for various reasons, is you're changing your IP address all the time. You're actually using a mobile device in a mobile way. You're actually moving around. And when you're doing that, uh, you know, whether you walk out of your office and you know, go on a different network, whether you went through a dead zone and now you're reconnecting to, you know, from instead of LTE or an HSPA, you're changing your IP addresses all the time. Is there a remedy for that? We'll, we'll talk about that too. Okay, so let's go back to that protocol stack picture here. This is what it looked like. Okay, now I want to strip it down to the essentials that you deal with or I deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. Why? Because this is the reality of the world. This is the install base of the world. If you look at, uh, you know, a million uses of the network today in the world, 99% of those would have just, actually this last exit has to go also. This, just this base stack. You're using TCP, UDP, over wireless, uh, over IP. Okay? Now, my thesis is, and I'm going to show you step by step in the next of the uh, in the next part of the talk, is that what we really need here is another smarter protocol stack between the UDP layer and the application. Why? There are constraints we have to deal with. As I said, there are billions of devices which are running this stack, which which have a uh, well-tested uh, IP, TCP, and UDP stack built in. There are millions of routers, or I don't know, maybe hundreds of thousands of routers around the world, which are routing these packets with TCP, UDP over IP today. You cannot go and change all of that stack. What you can do is you can take advantage of what you have, use UDP as a proxy for IP in the user space, and write your write your protocol on top of that. And and that's uh, that's my suggested solution, and uh, it should come as no surprise, spoiler alert, that I think we built that solution. Okay. So, so here you know enough with the abstract, very abstract uh, boxes, uh, which are describing protocols. Let's talk about what's actually happening when you when you um, get some data on your mobile device. So, you have a mobile device connecting to a server, wants to make a request, get a response, right? That's it. This is the simple diagram. You have two nodes going across the internet, making a connection, and getting some data. So simple. Could not be simple, right? Right? Look at the Look at the Look at the It's not so simple. And I'm going to talk to you about why it's not so simple. I'm going to use a device that uh, you will see in every paper, every textbook, uh, every conversation about uh, network protocols. It's called a network timing diagram. And uh, it's actually much simpler than it sounds. All it is is you're describing the exchange of packets between two nodes on the internet, or any network for that matter, um, across time. And in this diagram, time flows in the forward direction, downward in the diagram. So, for example, if the phone has sent a, a packet to a server, it's moving in space to the right, towards the server, and moving in time downwards. So this, this describes a packet going to the server. 
In the reverse direction, uh, you have another packet going back to the phone. Now, this is what we call a round trip. This is a round trip is something you hear a lot. So, this is the time taken for a round trip. Round trip time is a is a key metric uh, in networking. Now, I'm going to put a number here, and I'm going to ask you guys. Does this number sound like a typical round trip time? Round trip time number. If you have heard of round trip times, no. if you have, yes, no, no. no? What if I was uh, sitting on my Comcast network at home and pinging Google? Would that work? Where is your phone? Or my phone is in the bay. <laughs> Good question. It depends. The answer is it depends, right? So this exists. 10 millisecond exists today. I, I'm using it at home. I'm using it in my office. But more typical, because of the reasons we talked about before, because majority of the traffic is over wireless, the more typ typical number is 100 milliseconds. 100 milliseconds is a tenth of a second. Okay? So you, if you do 10 of these round trips, you spend a second. And when it, once it goes beyond about a third of a second, human perception catches on. You can actually feel the weight at about a third of a second. So a, a tenth of a second is a significant amount of time. So that's what timing that is. Uh, I just described it, right? Okay, 100 milliseconds. That's a, that's a typical, remember this number. 100 milliseconds, one tenth of a second. If you do five of these round trips, it's half a second. Half a second is annoying to a, to a human trying to access an app. All right. So this was our simple request response. We want to see how, we want to go in depth and see how that will play out when you go into that timing diagram. All right. So what does your device do when it's trying to make that request? The first thing it has to do, I'm, okay, I'm going to show you a timing diagram device to cloud. Uh, it's not uh, just to one server, but multiple servers in the cloud. So what does this device do? First of all, it needs to access the IP address. It needs to, it needs to get the IP address of whatever domain that it needs to connect. So let's say the domain it needs to connect to is cnn.com. As I mentioned earlier, you cannot connect to just cnn.com. You need an IP address to connect to. That's how you route packets. So a DNS lookup will give you that address, domain name service. Okay, and that's that's one round trip. All right. So once you've done that, you're you're good to go, right? No, you're not good to go. You still have to do a TCP handshake, and TCP handshake eats up one more round trip. Remember, you've done two round trips, and you still haven't done any actual uh, useful work on the network. Okay. Now you've done the TCP handshake. Now now you can start sending a request, right? Uh, maybe not. Why? Because most of the domains on the internet today are usually being accessed by HTTPS protocol. So you need TLS layer on top of your TCP. What does that require? That requires at least two more round trips in most cases. Two more round trips. So now you got one, two, three, four round trips. And if you, if you keep that 100 millisecond number in your mind, you spent 400 milliseconds. You spend about half a second. You haven't done any useful work here. So now I'm going to introduce another term here. We want to talk about how much bandwidth you used. It's different from how much bandwidth is available. When you buy a network connection, whether it's on mobile or in a chair at home or office, they will always quote a bandwidth number. It's 10 megabits per second. It's 100 megabits per second. Right? How much bandwidth have you used in this half second so far? You know, if you ask me, the answer is a big fat zero. I haven't really used any real bandwidth. I haven't done any useful work. All I've done is just some handshakes. Okay? Now that's the way you say it in networking is that your throughput that you obtained was zero. So I'm going to use this word throughput a lot going forward. So you had available bandwidth, but you didn't use it. Now, wouldn't it be nice? If you could actually do this all in a single round trip, instead of taking so many round trips. Also, remember mobile apps. Mobile apps have a concept of a session. Once you have, 
once you have opened your mobile app, you have established, you have not established a network session, but you have a user session in progress. Wouldn't it be nice if you could actually connect this user session concept to the network session concept? You could establish a session once, which does the discovery for you, which does the encryption for you, which has the you know all the networking handshakes already done, and you use it for the rest of the session. That's not what's happening right now on your devices. But, but that's a promise. Who would be doing who would be doing something like that? I don't know. I don't know. Okay. So you know we talk about slow uh, handshakes and, and you know this is this is how my conversations go usually. I'm at the airport or I'm in a coffee shop and somebody starts asking me, what do you do? And I say, oh, you know, network, faster networks or whatever. But say, oh, the handshakes, you reduce the handshakes. No, 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 that's not all. That's, that's just the beginning. That's something you start with. If you, if you got rid of some of the handshakes, you got rid of some good round trips, but that's not all, that's just the beginning. So let's talk about the next problem. Next problem is TCP slow start. Because what what's happened is um, we are all we have all been forced to use this one protocol, which was perfected and created over many decades, to handle many many different general requirements. This protocol is supposed to work on satellite links to Antarctica, which have probably a you know a a, a ping latency of 300 milliseconds, a third of a second almost. But they are also supposed to work well between two big hawking servers in a data center connected by a 10 gig interface where the latency might be in microseconds, in thousands of milliseconds. And, and, and to deal with all these possible cases, TCP has had to adopt this very general algorithm, something that's, that kind of works across all these cases. And that's what we call slow start. Because so let me give you an example of the phone is trying to get a 100 kilobyte file. It's a typical image. It's like a typical JPEG. Trying to download it. It's 100 kilobytes. You just started a fresh TCP connection. Uh, what does what happens here? After you've done the DNS, after you've done the TNS connection, you start, you make a request, and you get some data. Now, this line is representing some data. How much data is that? Uh, it's not 100 kilobytes. It's never 100 kilobytes. Or you might ask, well, what if you know I was on my fast office connection? Will it be 100 kilobytes? No. What if you are on the fastest LTE available in the world? No. It will never be 100 kilobytes. It's something in the range of, you know, depending on the network stack, perhaps 3 to 10 to 15 kilobytes at max. So let's assume the best case scenario, where the server is tuned to be the most aggressive server, and you have the best connection possible you will get that 100 kilobyte file like this in about four more round trips. So remember, you spent four round trips to do all the handshakes, and then you spent four more round trips to get that 100 kilobyte file. Now, I'm going to say this is costing you money. You're losing money. I'm going to show you how. So let's talk about how much time it took. This one took 400 milliseconds. And the handshakes took 400 milliseconds. Total of 800, 800 milliseconds. How much throughput did you get out of this link? How much throughput did you get? I did the calculation for you. It's something in the range of 1 megabit per second. So here's what I'm telling you. No matter how much money you're spending on your networking, no, ma no matter how expensive your office internet is, no matter how expensive your LTE connection is, if your round trip is around 100 milliseconds, you're going to get no more than one megabit per second in the first connection you make. One megabit per second. Do you know how much you are actually paying for? How many people in this audience have, say, LTE on your on your phones today? Raise your hand. Show us. How many people don't have LTE? I think that's a better question to ask. One guy. What do you have? Three G. Three G is 150 milliseconds or 200 milliseconds. So. Yeah, so you, you're spending, what, $80 on your LTE connection? You're not going to get something in the range of what they promised. What did they promise? Has anybody read the fine print on the LTE or, <laughs> or the spec? Okay, let's say LTE promises 2 megabit per second. 
Yes, no, show of hands. LTE promises 2 megabit per second. Yes? Yes? LTE promises. Huh? I think they just promised. They just promised, but that's in the spec. There's a spec. It says this is the radio spec. This is the bandwidth you should be able to obtain. And actually, they will show you once the bandwidth is ramped up. They will show you, uh, you know, in a, in a demo. But the problem is not LTE. The problem is what are you doing on LTE? They will not take this test as a valid test, but this is what 99% of the traffic on the internet is doing. So LTE is actually promising you 5 to 50 megabits per second, depending on which network. Up to 50 megabits per second. You are paying for it. But you are not using it because the software you are running on your phone, not by choice, this is what you got. And it's not even by, for example, Apple's choice. It's not even by Google's choice. This is the damn spec. This is how you expect it to live. Yeah. It depends on the activity. Sure. Yeah. I'm. I'm saying there is no activity. I, I'm not even, I would be ecstatic if at some point I actually managed to benchmark 50. But 5? You should be able to get 5. I think you will get 5 if you run the right test on it. If you run the right protocol on it, I think you will get 5. Yeah, but let's be real. If you had 100% optimization, they would never promise you this because they don't put that on the camera. There we go. That's so everything's fine. So it's, it's not in, there's a lot of forces that don't really want you know that to be. Nobody has a problem. Yeah. That's not the case though. We'll talk about problems later. That's not the case. There are a lot of people who have problems or losing money. Who are losing money? We'll be paying more for more. I mean. I'm not talking about the users. Users are paying whatever money they're paying and they are saying okay, but it's the app developers who expect a certain amount of certain level of experience for the users. They're not getting it. And this is just the first problem. This is just the first problem. Uh, we go through many of these. Okay, so, and that is not to say that TCP is always showing this worst case. I'm showing you a worst case. But it is showing you the worst case every day. You're actually, you're actually seeing that worst case every day. Okay, so I keep coming back to, yeah. So I have this suspicion, and it's only anecdotal, but I have this suspicion that for Facebook, Facebook might have special relationships with Verizon and their carriers. Because Facebook, even though everything is super slow, I'll upload a picture on Facebook and it seems to be a pretty It will, I, it's not impossible at all. They're pretty good. They're pretty good. Uh, they use it. I know they do that, but. It's not impossible, but remember that Facebook is still bound by the laws of physics. I know. I know. Just wondering if, if when your phone is. What about CD and switching? CD and switching? When your phone is in your pocket, I don't know if you have the Wi-Fi connection, etc. The push button, and the the way to pay for it, for you to get you know instant offers, the instant advertisement, and all that stuff. It's like it's really good. Yeah. CD and switching. Can you elaborate on your question? So that is streaming, right? Yeah. You should be able to uh, understand the KPIs that there are user issues yeah. and. Uh, uh, there are systems available. Absolutely. So what I'm hearing from you, what I'm hearing from this gentleman here, uh, Facebook is doing something special, Netflix might be doing something special, adopting streaming. Why, why are the software, the app developers being forced to do all this extra work? And this is not the only extra work. I'm going to go into things which are much more basic than that. Even there, it's the app developer's responsibility to work around those problems, as opposed to the OS and the protocols that should be providing the solution. But it's also, I mean, the developer can't do sloppy code. The developer needs to know to resize images. I mean, there's a no. lot of things that Why? on the developer. Oh, <laughs> Why is it on the developer? Well, because because, because, ban be because bandwidth isn't limited. The bandwidth, it's it's the not actual unlimited, physical right? bandwidth is available. Yeah. This but is what I'm, my thesis is, actual physical bandwidth is available. And we're just not making good use of it. Go ahead. I, I, I didn't hear that, sorry. Are you suggesting you're going to develop a specific CD 
Not not specific CDNs. If I'm hearing you correctly, uh, I'm going to go into some of the answers to these are some of the questions I'm raising right now. So so give me give me a chance to go through your slides, and then maybe things will become more clear. And I'll I'll be here all night for questions. No worries. I think there's enough beer back here, right? All right. So so we have this slow start. Can we do a smarter start? Is it possible? Who might be doing such a thing? I have no idea. So let's think, let's look at a possible smart start. Um, we, you know, we, I had some questions about how developers are trying to work around these things, but can actually the network do something like this? And the problem here is, as I described earlier, PCP is trying to work the same way across a thousand different networks. It's been designed for that, and it does very well for that. But what if? What if you went crazy and you decided, no, 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 I'm going to actually have specific algorithms for specific networks. And I'm going to detect them in real time, I'm going to query them in real time, and I'm going to do the right thing for that network. For example, you have the same diagram as before, okay? And you have the same, same task, download a 100 kilobyte file, right? And when the request goes to the server, the server, instead of you know, in a down TCP fashion, just trying to send 14 kilobytes, did something like this. It did a lookup. If the server did a lookup to say, let me see what network this is. It's LTE, Verizon, San Francisco, this time, you know, phases of the moon, what have you, whatever the whatever the factors are that you need to consider. And then did the right thing for that network. Could that be done? I don't know. Maybe somebody is doing it. You might even have somebody like this in the room. <laughs> but so so this is very possible, and this is being done today. Uh, we can talk about this more later. I, I'm not able to mark it. So let me go to the next problem. Uh, the previous problem, actually. By the before we got to the TCP slow start. We had all these going on, right? What if you don't have to do all these every time? Every time you connect to a new domain. What if you don't have to do that? One, one, what if you establish a session once at the beginning of the app, and then just you use it for the rest of the session? You maintain the state. If you had all that, and if you had the smart start, you know how much throughput you would get from the same connection? You would get about 8, I did the math for you, about 8 megabits per second. Assuming the 8 megabit was available for that. So, and, and this is not magic. This is a software. This is a software that looks at the same problem in a different way and solves it for a particular case. Solves it for the case of mobile apps sending you enough information with their request to let you make a smart decision. So we talked about you know, the bad handshake problem, we talked about the slow start problem. And the slow start problem can be solved if somebody actually uh, had a knowledge about all the networks in the world. Is that possible? I don't know. Maybe it is. Maybe someone has done it. We have done it. So, okay. so, so what we've seen in slow start so far, uh, that is the best case by the way. The slow start that gave you one megabit per second. That was the best case in this in this particular scenario. What is what is a slightly less than best case? Slightly less than best case is reality, everyday reality. You're moving around, you're in the shadow of a building, there are solar flares, there are clouds, you're losing packets. You're losing packets over the air. And losing packets is a big, big deal for DC. I'm, I'm losing packet. It's shown here with a red line here. As, as is obvious. Um, what happens when there's packet loss? What happens with TCP if there's packet loss? I'm going to go through two or three different looks at this problem. First of all, I'm going to show you just a schematic of packet loss occurred. You see here, TCP had already ramped up to its high bandwidth scenario. It was giving you good throughput. 
But then suddenly you walked, you know, to the wrong corner of the building and dropped one packet. One packet. And TCP says, no, no, no. I'm going to back the heck off you. Why? Once again, TCP was designed for the situation where everything was connected by wires. So think about this. Everything is connected by hard wires end to end. It's, it's, it's not circuit switching, but still, every device on the network is connected by a hard wire. What does that mean? That it's very rare to lose a packet on a hard wire. Very rare. Yes, there will be induction losses. Yes, there will be bad wires. Yes. But it will be a rare case. And it will be fixed once it's discovered. But the case today, in the wireless world, you cannot fix it. You know, again, you're bound by physics. You cannot fix all the packet loss. You can try your hardest. You can try trading packet loss for some other property, like maybe latency, and this is what physical networks do. But you cannot get rid of all packet loss. All physics packet loss in the medium. And, and this assumption, this uh, reaction, which is I'm going to back off because I'm causing congestion in the network, is wrong. Is wrong in most of the cases. The problem is, I'm showing you the same thing again. If even if it ramped up, it could not, it could not, um, you know, uh, go beyond this speed. And you would actually see in reality, you would take packet captures off a connection, going over a regular Wi-Fi network, and you would see that it will just fail to go beyond a certain throughput because every once in a while a single packet will drop because of the physical environment, and you lost the packet, and you lost the throughput. Okay. So now I'm going to show you a different view of the same thing. I'm going to show you a real experiment, data from a real experiment, that shows clearly how even a tiny amount of packet loss will cause havoc on your Okay. So this is this is the data. Here. I'm trying my hardest to not take over this, by the way. So this there's a bunch of data here. So let me uh, let me kind of go over it uh, slowly. So. This is the chart of throughput versus pack, uh, probability of packet loss. And this is created by experiments. This is done uh, by, actually, this, I, I stole this data and this image from this blog post uh, from Thousand Eyes. Okay. The experiment is that you connect two devices and simulate packet loss in the connection between them. And then you try to run TCP through. And what you're seeing is three lines. You're seeing you see a theoretical line. There is actually a theoretical model of how the throughput will change with packet loss. And there is a formula. The formula is published in 1997 by Matthew Mathis. Um, and, you can, and, the, and the green line is what the formula says is going to happen at any given packet loss. 1%, 2%, 3%, 4%. I'm going to focus only on 1% packet loss. Why? I'll show you reason. I'll show you in the next slide. But 1% packet loss is a good number to focus on. So let's, let's look at that. So at 0% packet loss, that means in the best possible scenario, the best real algorithm, which is called Cubic, this is a TCP protocol algorithm for congestion control. It was able to achieve 3,500 kilobits per second of throughput in the best scenario in that network. Okay, now, Watch what happens uh, when you have 1% packet loss. With 1% packet loss, the throughput you obtained was less than one third. 1% packet loss. In the ideal scenario, you should have uh, obtained 99% of the throughput. Or maybe not so ideal scenario, 90%, 80%. You're getting one third with 1% packet loss. So, so here's my question. I'm going to show you some real data. But here's my question. And this will merit a t-shirt. Okay? How many people think that you see 0.1% packet loss on a daily basis? Let's say 0.1 to 0.5% packet loss on a daily basis. Raise your hand. Show us. You see about 0.1 to 0.5. I'm, I'm going to go higher too, by the way. So <laughs> how many people think that it's going to be 0.5 to 0.8% packet loss on a daily basis? Okay, how about 1% packet loss on a daily basis? Okay. Yeah, I think I kind of gave it away. Right? The whole 1% thing. <laughs> 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 Alright, so 1% packet loss is very common in the US. Um, 
Uh, I think you do deserve teaching. <laughs> okay. So, so let me show you actual data. This is data coming from our own measurements. We have a few million, as Patrick was mentioning, we have a few million devices running our SDK currently in the world, and we're collecting a couple of billion data points a day from all over the world. And this is showing you uh, the actual percent of packet loss from around the world. Uh, you, you can see some the usual suspects, you know, doing well and usually not doing so well. But doing well, let's look at the doing well usual suspect. Green, USA, 1.3 percent average packet loss. 1.3 percent is across all networks, but majority of use, uh, U.S. internet usage is coming from LTE or Wi-Fi. And LTE and Wi-Fi are 1.2 and Sorry, Wi-Fi is 1.2 and LTE is 1.6 percent, approximately. This is real packet loss on a daily basis that you see on your $80 a month network. Okay, so what what that means is that you are almost never likely to achieve more than one third of the bandwidth you actually paid for. Your achieved throughput is likely to be about one third or less of the bandwidth you paid for because you're using TCP. So. What is the, what happens? The spinning wheel of death. I'm really fond of this. So, let's talk about why TCP has to do that. Why does it have to treat every packet loss as congestion? Is there a good solid reason? Uh, first of all, is it even possible for the TCP sender side to know that it's a congestion loss and not, not, you know, a loss due to being in the shadow of a building. Is it even possible? Uh, yes. Raise your hands. Show of hands, yes. No. Show of hands, no. 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 Okay, so when there's a yes or no question, I expect <laughs> all the hands to rise <laughs> for one of those two options. Okay, I'll, I'll give you one option. Maybe? Is maybe a good answer? Still, come on. Yes, come on. What? what? You can say maybe. Maybe it's no no commitment there. All right. So the act, act, answer actually is maybe. The answer is maybe only if you're not bound by a lot of the things that TCP has TCP's design has cornered it into. If you were if you were able to write that protocol that I talked about, which was sitting between the app and and UDP, and were free to do anything you want when it comes to acknowledgments, when it comes to timers, when it comes to memory management. You can actually, with a, a good precision, fairly decent precision, can guess whether this packet loss was due to congestion or this packet loss was due to physical loss. I'll be happy to engage anybody who wants to challenge me on this for like an hour after the talk. Okay? <laughs> because we've done it. We've done it. And, and if you think about how it can be done is you watch history. You watch a history of a connection, not just that one event of a packet loss. So with a history of a connection, you can guess with high level of certainty that this is packet loss due to congestion or this is packet loss due to uh, physical medium. Okay. So if we did have that confidence, if we did have that level of certainty, that we can tell with high degree of uh, certainty that it packet loss is actually not due to congestion. It's actually due to a drop, a real drop in the medium. Well, you could do something like this. <coughs> you could resend just the packet. Perhaps you can back off and be a little bit cautious, but resend just the packet instead of decimate or instead of making your throughput one third of the available bandwidth, maybe 90%, 80% with 1% packet loss, that would be a good win. It would be a huge win. So this is something we do. Now, yeah. what, if the, what if the whole stack was built from scratch? Assuming that packet loss would be a huge problem, and not just congestion packet loss, but real physical packet loss. Who would do such a thing? I have no idea. Who would do? Who would go to those those lengths? Anyway, so as I said before, uh, we 
if you have ever tracked a book on networking, or if you ever even heard you know, two network geeks, geek, geeks talking about uh, this, this subject, you would have heard packet loss, you would have heard slow start, you would have heard round trip time. But something that most people don't talk about, this is, this is probably, I think, the key from this talk. If you want to, if you want to take one message away, the next section it is. And it's going to be, it's going to be a story. I'm going to tell you a story. There was this little boy, innocent little boy, about 10, 12 years old, wanted to listen to music. He was downloading songs on his iPhone. But he had to go out with his friends at the same time. So he walked out of his house, disconnected from Wi-Fi. He, sh he was sure that as soon as he steps out, he'll be connected to Wi-Fi, And he kept waiting, and he kept waiting, and he kept waiting, and he, kept waiting. And he gave up. Never got that song out. Why? Because he's only a 12 year old boy. He would not. He would not be patient beyond say 20. I do have a 9 year old boy, so I know. He would not wait for more than 20 seconds for that song. Should he have to wait for more than 20 seconds? For that song? That's the question we're going to answer. But before I do that, I want to ask you one question. Uh, who here has not had that experience? Please raise your hand. Okay, so who here has had that experience? Still, some hands are still not busy. <laughs> Come on, guys. <laughs> you can get a T-shirt. <laughs> All right. So everybody, everybody knows this frustration, right? You walk, you walk out of your uh, nice Wi-Fi. You have a nice LTE available on your phone, but you're waiting for like 50 seconds, or you're waiting for a minute, waiting for more than why? Who do you, who do you blame? Just one word answers. Who do you blame when that happens? Crap, you have to go. Crappy app developer, that's the right answer. But anyway, <laughs> who, do, who do the rest of the people blame? Network. Yes, you had a hand on <laughs> Who do you blame? You blame network. Yeah. You blame the network. You blame the physical network. You blame LTE. You know, why is it not coming up? Uh, so, um, the problem is there is one party that nobody is blaming, and that's Apple or Google. Why? Because it's their sucky networking stack in the kernel that you have no control over. That's causing most of this problem. Some of this problem is, of course, you know, you are moving from one network to the other. There is a discontinuity. You have to deal with that. But in fact, maybe you should even be blaming Bill Joy, who wrote the original socket interface, because some of the problem lies there. Maybe you should be blaming the original developers of TCP, <laughs> who thought that IP address is the ultimate uh, endpoint? Maybe, maybe you can do better than that. Yeah. So, uh, what if if I send the information, like say I have, I got all of these packets in my in my mobile, so so you cache, my initial you saying you cache the initial data data right. and in my initial request, I just piggyback it with the initial request and send back to the server. Um, great, great thinking. A smart app developer. Will actually go, and we have seen. We have we talked talk to app developers all day long. We have seen app developers go through amazing hoops, amazing hoops to try to fix this problem. But you cannot, you cannot, because the programming model, which is based on the TCP model of networking, yeah, is broken. That's the problem. Yeah. Okay. So, so let me show you a real example of this problem. So remember that this is the one. If you want to take out. Uh, you heard a lot of people talk about packet loss and uh, round trip times. But this is something you probably have not heard about. So let me show you let me show you a diagram. Can people back in the back and see this? Maybe on that screen over there? OK. So let's see what's happening here. This is a packet capture, a real packet capture of, from an iOS app, which is, which is doing the following. It's, uh, it's making a HTTP request for a for a piece of content, and then the Wi-Fi is shut down, and LTE comes on. Okay, and it's um, it's waiting for a timeout, and then it's going to retry that same uh, connection once once the timeout has happened. Okay, so I'll show you uh, the actual events that are happening here. So first of all, this is where Wi-Fi was lost. If you can read, and you cannot read, I'll read for you. This is the 10 second mark. 
This is a synthetic test. We made it a large file and we made it a very slow connection. Okay. This is a 10 second mark. At 10 second mark, Wi-Fi was lost. And at the 30 second mark, 20 seconds later, the download was restarted. This is using actual packets. The red dots, by the way, are TCP connections being started. So what you're seeing is 20 seconds between when you lost Wi-Fi and when a new connection was started. Okay? Now, those red dots are basically new TCP connections being started. Um, OK. Now, if you watch the green dots here, green dots are telling you when the network is available. In the portion of the line where there are no green dots, there is no physical network available. Wi-Fi was up, available up to 10 seconds. Then, see this blue? That's where there's no actual physical network available. How did we get this? The green dots are actually just pings. We're doing a ping in a background process to a remote host. At 20 second mark, LTE came back. And watch, there's a 10 second delay until the new connection was started. Why this 10 second delay? Why? I'm not going to ask a why question because that could lead down a blind alley. But the question I'm going to ask you this is this. You see this 20 second gap? This 20 second gap is only because in my synthetic test, in my synthetic chart, I forcefully reduce the timeout to 20 seconds. So I can show you this chart on one screen. But if I hadn't done that, which most of the people don't, most of the app developers don't, do you know what the timeout is? Uh, should I just say number? Okay, 10 to 20 seconds? 45? Um, okay, this is an iOS, this is important here. So this is an iOS application. 60 seconds. 60, 60 seconds is a timeout. Why 60 seconds is a timeout? Because, because there's a lot of history behind it. And the history uh, is misleading us as usual. So the 60 second timeout, if I hadn't done this, if I hadn't reduced the timeout to 20 seconds, this restart would happen out here at 70 seconds. And, and this is something that you will never hear being discussed, this problem. Why? Because there is absolutely nothing you can do about it. There is absolutely nothing you can do about TCP timeouts. Yes. Question. Uh, yes. Uh, there's no question that it's secure. Uh, yes. So um, this. TCP is doing two basic things. One, it gives you reliable transfer, which you do in some way. Yeah. So whatever you do, you know, you do swarms, you know, whatever, whatever you do, you don't have to deal with loss. One way or the other. If that letter is working, this is going to affect all of them. The second thing is. This is not going to affect all of them. I'm going to show you an example where it does. Uh, the, second, the second thing is uh, security, because the data group works, works and the same security is also sorted to let as well. Right, you know, you play attacks, whatever. So eventually, once you have the same functionality, you are going to maybe be a bit better to security. Yeah. That's, that's, I've heard uh, this so many times. I probably started having these conversations. Uh, the question is, I'm saying this because yes. we have implemented infrastructure, we run Unity really for three years now, we have problems with SDKs, and yeah. numbers. Yeah. So you can do almost so much better. So I, I have not questioned yeah. what you're doing, you did it three years ago. Yes. But uh, this is uh, the thing that you have to deal with. Yes. So the real way to deal with this is to go application level and ask them why do you need a lot of transfer? Yes. Or why do you that's one, so one, that's, that's the biggest yeah. thing. I mean, this is yeah. this is easy part. Yeah. Okay. So. So the, I mean, I think I don't think everybody heard that, but basically, the assertion is that the real way you deal with this problem is you don't necessarily need reliable transport in every situation, and that's actually right. You can there's a lot of things you can actually do better if you have out of order transport and you had uh, enough metadata in each of your datagram so that you can you know your application. But how many app developers do you think who have the capability? or the interest, or the time, who can actually go through all of that. That's it's a very, very small number. And I, I think I lay the, the blame down at the feet of the, you know, the, the operation, operating system developers. They have to fix this problem. But if they don't, we have a solution. So uh, you know, thank God for that. <laughs> so, so anyway, so let me show you how it can work better. You know, 
once again, I, I told you this is this is the bane of my life, and I keep showing you this. Now, if you did, you know, notwithstanding uh, the question you asked, if you did actually uh, build something from scratch, which will not rely on just the IP address as the address as the final endpoint address, but you could actually build out something which will treat, which will give it a real identifier. When I when I'm talking about an app running on a device. I think that app running on a device is its own unique thing. It's it doesn't change. It's not. I mean, when you're using it tonight at home, when you're using it tomorrow morning in the office, when you're using it the next <coughs> day, it's not going to change. So why can I cannot I treat that entity as the endpoint that I'm directing my packets to? Now, of course, I still need an IP address at any given moment. But that should be my job as a as a provider of the software stack to you, the application developer, to make it work for you. Not your job as the application developer to go and you know try to meddle with that level of the stack. Okay, so let's say such a exciting thing did exist. How would that behave? You're lucky because I'm going to show you. So this is the same operation conducted by a protocol. I don't know who's a protocol that actually does the right thing, that actually identifies the device and the app installed on it as one entity and does active acknowledgments from the client side to reconnect as soon as the connection is available. So now watch this. You, you started the transfer at the red dot and the network was out for these 10 seconds, same 10 seconds where the blue, where there are no green dots and as soon as the physical connection became available you restarted the transfer. And this, this, this takes many different things. It takes the center side to know where this device is now. You change your complete network, not just the IP address. It, it requires the center, the, the receiver side to help. So if you build something like that, this is how it will behave. Now watch, this only takes 30 seconds to finish. Once again, this is an artificial example with a huge file. So the previous one took 100 seconds to finish. So. The lesson here is, uh, you know, the, my, as I keep mentioning, the lesson here is that the the stack we're using is not built for today's world. It's not built for your life as it is today. It's built for 1980s, 1990s, and there is there's a lot you can do despite the constraints of what's available in operating systems and what's available in the routers and the middle boxes. There's a lot you can do, and we're doing. It. We are currently serving something like half a billion requests a day around the world using this system. Um, and you know, I, I started with this diagram, and I told you that this is this is where the answer will be, and it is. And um, this is how we would like to solve this problem. Thank you very much. And any other data that we have. So, in case you guys didn't catch on with the subtleties, Packetzoom has fixed this. <laughs> and uh, it's available right now. Um, you know, Mario mentioned uh, changing from higher resolution images to lower resolution images and to tie it back into uh, to customer experience. You know, if you're going to go with a lower resolution image just so it loads faster, um, that's not a very good customer uh, or user experience, right? Um, there was talk of building your own protocol and you know, how much time your developers can spend on that. Um, it's already fixed and it's, uh, it's easy to do. Um, the Packetzoom solution provides you uh, three different things. It provides you analytics um, into your HTTP uh, requests. We can show you where your errors are coming from, uh, what's going wrong with your network. Uh, we can even break it down by URL, which, which URLs are failing, which URLs are uh, getting 404s, uh, 503s, whatever it might be. We can show you the response time distribution of your, uh, your requests. Uh, which countries, countries by response time, uh, we've got a ton of data and uh, we make it all available to you. Where in the world your requests are coming from. <coughs> Once you see these analytics, you can optimize your requests. You can turn on packet zoom, speed up your Wi-Fi by 200%. Uh, and you know, a lot of people think Wi-Fi is great, but uh, in my tiny apartment from my living room to my bedroom, I've got a ton of packet loss and we can help out even Wi-Fi. You can optimize your uh, your API call, your dynamic requests, um, make them faster and more reliable. 
and we can reduce your disconnects. So uh, anytime a request is made and you uh, change IP address, that request will fail. Um, with packaging, we reduce uh, disconnects by 80% or so. And we provide you control. You can pick what you, which URLs will go through Packet Zoom. You can turn Packet Zoom on and off dynamically from the dashboard. Uh, turn HTTPS support on and off. Change the percentage of users that would go through Packet Zoom from the dashboard. And uh, our, our customers love us. We've got uh, over 347 apps uh, from 68 different customers, around 42 million uh, monthly access, uh, active users. And uh, implementation could be simpler. You install the SDK, it's uh, drag and drop. You add one line of code to initialize the SDK, and then you control it all from the dashboard. Uh, you set the filters for which you will go through packet zoom. Uh, as I said, off and on, uh, percentage of users that go through. And uh, you sit back, deploy your app, and, uh, and watch the benefits. What's the revenue model? <laughs> Great question. Uh, we, we charge per uh, daily active user, so uh, what, our understanding is that most developers are used to thinking about things on a daily active user uh, level. And so we charge... Uh, so your servers are pinged every time too? Every time, every time a request is made for a URL, you set up your regular expression to go through Packet Zoom, um, unless it's cached on the device. Yeah. So the DAO is 500 daily, right? What's that? The DAO, the DAE is 500 daily. Is that correct? Uh, are you talking about for free? Oh, at the base level. Yeah. Yeah. Any other questions? Technical or otherwise? Yep. Uh, maybe you can help me understand. So um, the proxy is me, uh, but it sits on the, the mobile device. And the request for different um, resources are deploying from the device to uh, a SAS, uh, I guess, a service that figures um, this is a central uh, service that routes all incoming requests. For yeah, sure. Can you repeat, so, can you repeat the question for the back? Yeah, so uh, the question is, how does it actually work? Right. right so the, the, the basic method is you get an SDK, install it in your app, and the app is, and you set a filter to say which we start seeing all your URLs going through. We hook into the libraries that do HTTP connections, and uh, as we see the the URL is going through, you would have set a filter on a dashboard saying only capture these and send them through package zoom proxy. So they're proxy through the package zoom infrastructure. Yeah. Right. Where is the geo filtering set? Uh, geo filtering is also set on the dashboard. You can say use it only for India or use it only for US or Europe or whatever your requirements are. According to time allocation as well. What is that? According to time allocation can be set a very We don't have time, like data in, like, time no, we don't have that picture. So you can time it out, set a timeout. Oh, timeouts. Oh, no, no, no timeout like this, because there's certain zones. No, no, he's talking about like time of the day. Yeah. Which time of the day it should be. No, we don't have that filter, but it shouldn't be very harsh. Yeah. Yeah. Yes? I can still ask you about the same thing. So, Good. I'm still trying to understand. Um, if a client's setting up the, the mobile device, yeah. um, so, it's trying, so it's actively trying to figure out whether a request for a certain URL needs to be sent to Package external or an external, so it has to. So yeah. whatever you are also have to set up okay. that list is to the client. Yeah. So you know, most apps would have many SDKs, ads, you know, um, analytics, what have you, and we don't want to capture all the stuff. We want to capture your stuff, right? Unless you want us to, we can actually capture it. So what we we see all the traffic going through on the client side, but. Dynamically, in real time, you can go on a dashboard and try changing, you know, which regular expression it should be filtered out, and and then we only use, you know, only send those URLs through package zoom proxy, and the rest goes through its normal destination. Question: Are the metrics via from the dashboard exportable as well? Uh, you can whatever charts you see in the dashboard, you know, we make their CSVs available. Mm -hmm. Multiple strings on a single connection? Multiple? Yeah. Teams. Yeah, multiple strings. So if I wanted to download multiple files from the same place, Absolutely. it doesn't create separate connections? Absolutely. In fact, one of the things I, I didn't even talk about here, but it's another important part of how Package Zoom does things different and better, uh, is that you, 
you know what what do people do i didn't i didn't really go into that here what do people do to defeat slow start right they would do multiple http connections so that there are four things going on at the same time so they can fill that pipe but the problem is how does tcp behave when that happens each single tcp stream is acting on its own even if it's going to the same server and it's trying to maximize its own bandwidth watching packet loss and then backing off it's a horrendously inefficient use of the network and i don't even know i mean I, my mind is blown when i first saw, learned about this a few years ago this is what you do what we do is we base you know your your key traffic you just hand it hand it to uh you know your through the http mechanisms which we also automatically capture they all just get queued and you can actually set priorities on the queue and you can say this type of url should get a higher priority than this other type of urls and we actually deliver it intelligently based on those priorities and if there's no priority they get intelligent they get delivered in a queue as we were as they were received yeah uh, what about the network security for like Oh, what promises are you making for your clients? Well, we we don't. So the, there is a lot of legal and regulatory stuff involved in uh, TLS. TLS has been written into uh, specs, like uh, um, uh, I'm forgetting the name, but the credit card uh, that uh, right. PCR. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. So you cannot, no matter what security guarantees I provide, unless I certify myself or call myself TLS somehow. it will not fly so we don't we don't even try to go and, and try to convince people to send secure stuff to us transactions or user data or anything like that the other part of this is that um the way we, we work you know you, you might be leaving traces on your device on the server side and we don't want any uh, privacy critical stuff to go sit on our devices so we stay clear of that but we do have encryption we all the entire remember i showed you the the first few Uh, round trips which are establishing the dns and the tcp and tls we actually do one round trip and we establish an encrypted connection uh and that that session stays for the lifetime of the application session so we do it once so everything that goes from the device to the package of proxy is encrypted yeah over the process yes sure. so is this is more idea for pub sub messaging uh, application we not no it's not it's not pub sub messaging there's a whole but, but there's a lot more in pub sub it's on top of this it could, absolutely absolutely it could, it could be in our future it could be in our future but right now it's not yes. uh any increased resource usage at the app level that's the interesting part it's actually reduced resource usage so uh that's a, in a half an hour lecture so <laughs> we can go into that but let me see Let me see. Okay, so actually, there is there is some trade secret type uh, techniques involved, which are very simple to state. If I once I state them, but I won't. Uh, we we use memory very very efficiently. Let's put it that way. We use memory very very efficiently, and if you look at uh, if you take a profile of the TCP stack, a large amount of that uh, CPU usage is actually memory management, buffer management, and we have. shortcut it back so yeah yeah go ahead why not yeah so it's not just on the java script language when you know the android so this language the memory it will multiple api call for one session at the same time but it's not parallel computer so there's no check the individual api call by itself so all the service must function on the same api call it start Yes. Yes. The, 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 the issue is basically you can cache it on one call, but the other one is not. So the rate is slow is okay because the number of streams that I call is around the same time. Yeah. One fast, one slow is really hard to do. Yeah, that's and yeah. that that is the one that we see all the time with the memory just allocated to that. You should definitely take my card and we we talk. But 
I, I was just mentioning we use some interesting techniques to uh, do buffer management in such a way that we don't hold on to any piece of memory for a long time, no matter how much hanging this connection is. Um, and uh, the, the scenario you're describing, once again, goes to show the, the model that, that we're using is broken. The model we're using is broken. The receive windows, the congestion windows, the windows in the application because now you're trying to defeat TCP's protocol in your application. So it's not a stack problem because fundamentally the, it's not a pair of computing problems. We have what if I call do to check in one of them at all. Well it, so at the at JavaScript layer it's not. It's not JavaScript is single threaded, but it's single threaded, but do multiple call. Yeah, but it's while, not, once it's in the kernel, it is actually parallel. Once it's in the kernel, uh, any modern kernel, it's happening in a parallel fashion. Like the two connections are being handled in a concurrent fashion. And most, even phones today have multiple processors, so they are actually running in parallel. Well, the language level, you can have checksum for individual call. So you yeah. don't know who failed. Yeah. Yes, uh, there are problems at multiple layers here that you're describing. Uh, we try to solve the more fundamental layer and unfortunately, we don't have a solution for the application layer issues here. Yeah. Go ahead. Uh, mm -hmm. Question. Yes. Uh, so, one, what's the install size? What's the uh, install size? Once uh, the app is downloaded and installed on a on a device, the increase uh, increment you see is something few hundred kilobyte range. Okay. Um, and again, for where's all the sequencing with a since UDP is. Yes, of course. Yeah, we do it in the user space. We wrote, we wrote our own code. Are you doing it at the server? server or are you no, it, it has to be done at both ends. So we do it at the client layer, but we take advantage of the fact without, again, without going into some kind of trade secret-ish things here, we take advantage of the fact that you're sitting on a mobile device and you don't have to behave the same way as we would in a general purpose computer that runs anyway. Yeah. Is there a way we can get the slides? Uh, absolutely. So please, uh, maybe maybe I'll put that up again. Uh, please tweet to us or, or tweet with that hashtag. Uh, I'll get back to you and get to the slides. I think we all yeah. also promised gift cards for anybody that integrates. Oh, yeah. So, so after this, we'll have a dev session, as promised, uh, with Mario. And uh, if you guys have your laptop, we'll show you how easy it is to integrate. And if you do manage to finish the integration, oh, not manage to, that should be easy. <laughs> but if you stay here to finish your integration, uh, you'll get a, a $25 gift card. But is it Amazon? Amazon and Starbucks, right? Yeah. How much of a time commitment are you looking at? I think you're looking at something like 20 minutes or so, no more than that. Five minutes. Well, we <laughs> open the laptop, you know, open Xcode, all that stuff. Trouble yeah. logging in. Yeah, check Facebook, <laughs> Slack. <laughs> By the time you actually get to the integration, it will be 15 minutes. Okay. And then the next five minutes is the real one, as usual. <laughs> yeah. What are some of the ideal scenarios that back in Zoom is looking for in starts industries as medical uh, biometrics? Currently, most of our usage is in three or four verticals. Uh, we have uh, retail e-commerce type apps, we have gaming, uh, we have um, social networking type apps. Is, is it the retail with last mile recognition? Uh, like for example, in you the geolocation? geolocation? Yes. Well, we do use geolocation for our use if it's available in the app, mm -hmm. but we don't provide that kind of APIs to the app itself. We, in fact, uh, you know, if you think about uh, integration of the SDK and comparing it to integration of any other SDK you might have done, the thing you should think about is we don't have any APIs to program it. It has to be hybrid. I mean, it doesn't, of course, you have to need some other APIs to hybrid it, to have a hybrid solution. For example, geospatial. Yeah, hey, perhaps, you know, there's, I think there's a long line of features we have ahead of you. And every time we talk to customers, we get more requests. Uh, we are a small startup, so we are, you know, working on a lot of these things. But in this, what, what I want to stress right now, if you actually open your laptop and try to, there is no package zoom API that you will be asked to code to. You will just be asked to write one line of code in it, and that's it. Everything else is automatic. And and we have worked very, very hard over the last three years to make it happen. Uh, it's not simple.
I'll be happy to take questions uh, on the side, the more detailed questions that probably not being addressed in this forum. But, and of course, tweet at me, and I'll be, I'll, I'll be happy to engage in conversations. And, all right? Okay. Great. Thank you. Great.